So when I joined the club, we had all of these huts. We had Green, Yellow, Jubilee, Ben Rudd's Big Hut Leaning Lodge and 25 Miles. So quite a selection. Well, the club's first hut, and it may well have been one of the first club huts in the South Island, was Green Hut. I think it was initially known as the Club Hut or Green Peak Hut, and it was built in 1933. It had seen better days. Much of the framing, I think, had been replaced with manuka poles. It's been vandalised and broken off, gone up the chimney. I think it was just because it was too close to the road. And it had got to the point where it had been a bit of wear and tear and attrition. It really wasn't worth fixing. The Jubilee Hut was a project to make the club's Jubilee, which was celebrated in 1948. By 1978, it was getting to be a bit manky. It was still completely weatherproof. Bunks were pretty scuzzy. The place had a strong reputation for rodent infestation, which kept me out of it. Actually, kept my brother out of it mostly. Been in there on a school trip, seen rats, and he wasn't going back in it. We got in the habit of camping down there, and the campsite's really nice. I never ever spent a night there. Well, up until 2007, the club owned the original Jubilee Hut, now being replaced by a dock hut across the river on a higher site, a much better site now. Um, Timbung Hut. Um, a much sunnier position. I think it's really helped the Silver Peaks develop. Every weekend it's pretty well fully used, so if you want a night in that hut by yourself, you could go in the week time there. The club used to take an interest in the other huts in the Silver Peaks site, so Poplar Hut, Mount John. A group of club members in the 60s who called themselves the Lamb Hill Carrying Company, who pretty well took over the homestead. Yellow Hut was a private hut. It blew away in the 1970s. Club group under the leadership and enthusiasm of Dave Craw stood it back up on its site. Part of the agreement to put in the new Jubilee Hut, the old Jubilee and Yellow Hut be removed. Yellow Hut was removed late last year. The new Philip Cox Memorial Hut's gone in as a replacement a wee bit further down the ridge. So we've still got a, we've got a pretty good four-bunk hut in that hut now. Further afield, the club had an interest in 25-mile hut in the Rees. Certainly by the 80s, there was no enthusiasm amongst club members for maintaining a, a hut that required you to go all the way to Glenorchy, and then it was only two hours tramp from the end of the road. Well, when I joined the club in 1985, we were still renting in Stewart Street, Polytech rooms, 261 Stewart Street. When they got demolished, we had a temporary one down in Dowling Street. We went up to Russell Street to the Sunday school rooms in the late 1980s. That was when we had a subcommittee looking for new club rooms. The club used to run a lot of bus trips, but there would always be a profit margin set in it. And it came from the days when the club had a club truck. The club had always aspired to have its own transport. So what it did was, when it ran bus trips, and we would run probably at least two every month, it would add a margin, and so at the end of each year it would declare a profit. It would be banked into a separate fund. But slowly over time we realised they were never going to get a club truck. And so this money built up and built up. And Thank I guess so it's morphed itself now over time into uh, these wonderful club rooms. In the late 1989, we found this building here in Three Young Street, former TAB. The club paid $40,000 for it out of accumulated funds. So we bought it, we converted it, and in 90, the club rooms were officially opened. Murray McDonald and husband Gordon, Murray was a life member, donated some money for the map ball that we have. This year has allowed us to colour photos. The maps really give it a bit of atmosphere. It's a good size for the club. We get up to about 50 people in here, which we do for Bush. We meet weekly, or BYOs, but you bring your own photos and slides of trips you've been on. We try to get outside speakers talking about things sort of to do with New Zealand and Otago in particular. We have a few overseas trips, but on average 30 to 35 people. Building's concrete block we replaced the roof two years ago, so there's not much work to do on it at the moment.
Francis Cooker, 1950s. Little, uh, all the original bits and pieces, little original spirit tin here for your priming. No, this man still has his eyebrows. But based on the style of tin, it's like a little lunchbox. Yeah. We're starting to get up the temperature now. And I remember the old hut. So there was a stone structure up here, which was Ben Rudd's hut. It was uh, very dilapidated. And I remember coming here and whether we were building the shelter at the time, he lived here for a relatively short period of time. He actually lived on the other side of Flagstar, on the top of Rudd Road. And the property was offered to the Tramping Club, and the Tramping Club ended up buying it. They were donated the money by the Stevenson family. His hut slowly became more and more dilapidated, so they built the shelter in 1972. So this has been the most successful club hut required a minimal amount of maintenance. Now Richard would like to say something about the vegetation. I was up here with the family group as a youngster. Campbell's in the McDonald's used to talk about the wonderful way that these trees were growing and uh, how much money the club was going to make one day and be the one of the wealthiest clubs, if not the wealthiest club in the country. <laughs> After my parents met and married, of course, in the club, uh, my children also owe their very existence to the Otago Tramping and Matrimonial. <laughs> but it was the family tramping group in the 60s that was started by Lyle Campbell and Mari McDonald group because every year there would be a trip here to Ben Rudd's for a picnic. Mari and Lyle would have the billy going down here and the fire on and I have never seen anybody that could boil a billy like those two. That billy is here in the shelter today. You've had a cup of tea made with water. <laughs> it's sad but also very significant for us to say too that those people have chosen when they have passed on now to come back to this place. Lyle's ashes are sitting under those beech trees up there. I know that Gordon MacDonald, Mari's husband, has some of his ashes are here too, are they? Yeah. And, and Bruce's ashes. So again, people have chosen, that have been closely associated with the property to come back. And so that's why, for people like me, it's so important that we maintain our links with this piece of property because it is a touch for us. Then uh, we come to the Rotten Pillars. They were, they were built as ski club huts. Otago Ski Club had been skiing on the Rock and Pillars since before the war using a, a stone farm building at the bottom of the hill as a base and then a stone lean-to shelter of sorts was constructed right adjacent to where Big Hut is now and then Big Hut was built in the late 40s. The skiing of the, the late 30s and 40s, Big Hut was flat rolling terrain sort of skiing. The need for speed arose. So Castle Rockfield I think was a, a last dash to try and stave off um, competition from Treble Cone but ultimately uh, skiing that involved walking up a hill for three or four hours to ski on relatively flat terrain soon fell out of favour until the advent of cross country skiing. There was a little hard core of cross country skiers in the club by the late 70s and early 80s. An article in Outdoors in the 70s of some guys who skied from Treble Cone to Coronet Peak on alpine gear. People were doing ski mountaineering, but the, the skinny ski revolution, Nordic skiing, really came in in the late 70s, early 80s. I must say, I was a useless skier, cross-country or otherwise, um, but it did appeal as a means of just travelling across uh, rolling terrain. The major factor was that the wilderness shop got a whole lot of cross-country high gear, and that enabled club trips to go. Some years, I think we got up to three or four official club cross-country trips. It's a rock and pillar hut, so they both moved into trusts, the Big Hut Trust took over Big Hut in 2004, and that's gone leaps and bounds since then. The Leaning Lodge Trust, which is run by the OTMC, this year completed a brand new hut on the original site, another mm. 10 bunk hut, fully insulated, double glazed. I was seconded by my wife who had had a meeting with a particular guy in this club that's known as the Phantom. He had put it in my wife's ear that Leaning Lodge was in a state of disrepair and my wife had said, oh my husband's a builder, he might be able to do something for you. We jumped in our four wheel drive, we got up here and it was as cold and as bleak a place as you could ever want to visit on that particular day. And we got into the hut and it was pretty good and then half an hour in there we had a cup of tea 
came out and the sun was shining, this is brilliant, well worth saving. Why was it leaning? Something to do with the foundations, but they were pretty much non-existent. And we looked under it and we thought, what the hell is it sitting on? Because one of the beers almost touched a bit of chest. Yeah, almost. And we couldn't see much out. <laughs> And um, I think at around about that stage, Doc said they're going to remove the huts. That was yeah, yeah. There was a few rocks with a couple of bearers that went across them that Almost. had big gaps and a few wedges driven in here and a few wedges driven in there. And, it just, and you could actually see when we demolished that distinct line right through the middle of the hut. Floor, walls, roof, the lot. An extreme situation. The hut would have actually broken in two perfectly. Oh, in the, middle. the only thing that holds it there, was holding it there, was the sheet of iron had actually lapped over the joint in the roof. So it was nailed this side and nailed this side, and there was no way it was ever going to fall apart because they used these bloody railway spikes, as I call them, to hold the roof on. It was leaning all right. Nothing to do with the ground it was sitting on. I did a bit of background on the huts, and they were pre-war. They were built by the army in 1939 in Burnham as single men quarters, and they were actually two single men quarters huts. Other bits and pieces added onto it by the ski club and did definitely lean. So did the long drop. They almost matched, angle for angle. It's dropping into the hole with a trust in. And Paul Cobbing said, I know a bit about fundraising, I'll do the fundraising. So an anonymous donor gave us 10 grand. The Phantom originally gave us some money too, Yes, didn't the Phantom gave us some money. I drew up a set of plans, which I gave to Alan and said, hey, this is my proposal. The trust gave me permission, and I went and bought a shitload of materials. I got my apprentice boys, and it was a good exercise for them to actually build this. We had to shift the hut a couple of times. One from my yard into Richard Forbes' place, and then from Richard Forbes' place up to the farmer's shed. The farmer up there, Brent McKenzie, was absolutely brilliant for it. To manually get this stuff over there is going to be a bloody nightmare. How much for a helicopter? So we duly went and got a quote for a helicopter. So we helicoptered everything up. But in the meantime, we'd actually pulled the old hut down. So you dug some pile, put some piles in around the outside of the old hut and put a bears at the end. Then we had to slide those beers in underneath. Yeah, and then we had to jack the hut up. So we jacked mm. the hut up. And during 630 mil we had to jack it. Was under, and, and then I we had to lift it again for the joist. And we thought, perhaps not. No, nah, so, perhaps not. Because so we pulled half the hut down yeah. so that we could actually still use half of the hut yeah. in inclement weather. Use the a little bit drafty. The front lean to part had come off and we had the new floor down. So we pre-assembled it in my yard. And then we disassembled it, packed it up. Labelled it. <laughs> Yeah, and did it go together like that? Uh, pretty much, yeah, but uh, with all the helping hands that I had, there was a few upside-down frames. and It looked quite yeah. comical going. It looked quite comical with frames being laid out. Oh, here's G, that goes with that G, and here's the J, that goes with that. Yeah, we, 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 we had a patch of weather where there's just no way we could get up there for like three or four weeks. And I'm talking snow, it was horizontal right. snow. First weekend of January this year, and Ray looked at me and said, you know, if we close this in and put the reef on, we could sleep in here tonight. And I'm looking at the truck. And we did. <laughs> thinking, oh, yeah. And we did. Oh, day, but we got there. Yeah. We didn't get the whole of the outside. No, we didn't get it all clad, but I'll tell you what, we got 90% of it done. Yeah. And that night it blew, and there was one piece of building wrap in it, like a PVC, and it just about drove me insane. I think I got about 10 minutes sleep when the wind sort of died down. Then he rings me up, he gets up and he goes, come on, it's breakfast time, we've got to get some more work bloody done. And I'm going, oh, hang on, see, I just shut my eyes. <laughs> but we had a real good weekend that weekend. We got it totally clad, windows in, flashings, pretty much. Not quite totally weatherproof, but pretty close to it. We did quite a few Friday night trips, so we had a full day Saturday and Sunday. Yeah. We started on the inside, so it didn't really matter if the weather was a little bit inclement. We didn't want snow or anything, but... 987 hours. Yeah. Real mixture of people. According to the builder, his, his comments regarding the voluntary labour were sometimes a wee bit disparaging. Everybody's going to see it. It's in, in the eye of the public. Not just the tramping club, but in the eye of the public. And you're not allowed to bruise the timber. But it just didn't quite <laughs> sink into them. You know, it's like... <laughs> why weren't the people stage? precise when they were nailing off the ply then? Struck mm, them correctly. I did verbally. Did you? Yes, Maybe several they times. Don't understand builder's language. The first official trip of the huts this weekend.
a uh, bit of a sad story to it, of course. This is the Phil Cox hut, who unfortunately left us a while ago, and um, it's on Yellow Ridge, it was opened in 2012 in memory of Phil. A, a great jogger and a great mate. Thank you. Oh, yeah. If anybody gets this wrong, they have to leave the room. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Lake Viola, yeah. After the, after the June snowfall, yeah, boy. Right.